friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise, as far as you know, and I've got a fun video for you today. A little while back, I did a couple of videos on snake myths, things a lot of the general population believe about snakes that is wrong. But did you know that there are also facts about snakes and reptiles in general that are widely believed by reptile people that are just as wrong, but for a variety of different reasons, they persist. Today, we will be tackling five myths that are entrenched in the reptile community. Let's get to it! Why do some misconceptions, some of which are pretty big and could affect how we care for our animals, persist in a community of well-informed reptile keepers? Well, if you ask me, and since it's my video, I'm gonna assume that you did, I think that many of these myths actually started out as the best information we had at the time and have since fallen out of date. Trusted voices, unaware of new information, continue to share what they know and it gets passed down to the next generation of enthusiasts as fact. It just takes a bit of time to shift away from entrenched thinking. Okay, first up is actually a myth I did include in my regular reptile myths, but I'm surprised at how often I hear this in well-produced documentaries about snakes or from reptile educators on YouTube. I've even seen zoo presenters fall victim to this one. Constricting snakes will kill their prey through strangulation, suffocation, or asphyxiation. Now, snakes can kill that way, but if or when that does happen, it's probably because something didn't quite go to plan. When our friendly neighborhood constricting snake squeezes their prey is way past asphyxiation. What does that mean? Well, let's define what asphyxiation is. Asphyxiation is the process of being deprived of oxygen resulting in unconsciousness and or death. There are four types of asphyxiation, suffocation, strangulation, mechanical asphyxia, and drowning. Drown. There are four. The fourth one's drowning. Without new oxygen being put into the blood that the heart and lungs are sending to the brain, there will be less and less oxygen until eventually unconsciousness occurs and then it dies. A snake squeezing around the prey animal's body would certainly be able to prevent them from breathing, but it's going to take a little while for death or even just unconsciousness to occur from lack of oxygen. That's time the snake's prey could use to bite and scratch and escape as they fight for their lives, putting the snake in very real danger. This is why snakes bypass the whole asphyxiation thing and go right to stopping any blood at all, oxygenated or otherwise, from getting to the brain. A squeezy snake hug exerts so much pressure that it overwhelms the circulatory system and the heart just cannot pump blood to the brain. Unconsciousness occurs in seconds and death very, very soon after. Signs of struggle or other types of movement once under full pressure are usually reflexes or a function of nerve impulses that just didn't get the memo that it's game over. Now, occasionally, a prey animal is able to escape after being squeezed like this. Maybe the snake is startled, or one of those twitchy nerve movements caused a bite or a scratch that caused the snake to let go. And the prey is free to go about their day. No harm, no foul. Yeah, not so much. You see, the squeezing and then releasing of that enormous pressure will cause potassium levels in the prey's bloodstream to spike drastically, and prey animal may slip away momentarily, but will almost certainly succumb to a potassium-induced cardiac arrest very quickly and may still end up making a meal for that hungry snake. Pretty gnarly, eh? My number two entrenched myth is that snakes are antisocial, unintelligent creatures with no emotion. Lots to unpack here. In my first draft of this script, I had all sorts of information on the history of studies on snake intelligence. And although it was very fascinating, it was also lengthy, very lengthy. <laughs> so I've decided to do a separate dedicated video all on snake intelligence. Be sure to hit subscribe and click the notification bell so you won't miss that when that video comes out. I imagine that one will invoke an active comment section. So. As for today, I'm just gonna keep it very high level. Here goes. Snakes have long been thought to be pretty unsophisticated, and it's not hard to understand why. 
They eat infrequently, so bribing them with food doesn't really work. Once they find an ideal spot at the temperature that they like, they often just kind of stay put. So there are definitely challenges in finding motivations to leverage to properly test their intelligence. In fact, for several hundred years, there were only a few studies done on reptile intelligence, which just happened to coincide with a lot of entrenched bias on the inferiority of reptiles. It's a whole, if you judge a fish by how it climbs a tree analogy, you know? Thankfully, scientists pushed through and there has been a huge increase in the number of studies on reptile intelligence in the last 30 years, there have been dozens conducted, many times the number that had been done previously in the last 200 years. Through these studies, we now know that snakes and other reptiles have brains that are not dissimilar in structure to our own, complete with the components and chemicals that govern emotion. These studies show that snakes do not operate solely on instinct as previously thought. They are thinking, feeling creatures who exhibit spatial learning that rivals the learning abilities of birds and rodents. Older and younger snakes differ in how they gather and decipher information about the world around them, meaning that they learn from past experiences and are able to plan. How well they do all this differs between species or even individuals. For example, Hobbes, my Macklitz python, is super smart and has demonstrated some pretty impressive problem-solving chops. My hognose snake Maggie, on the other hand, has two brain cells that are constantly competing for third place. But she's really, really cute. It is pretty common knowledge that there are some species of social snakes, garter snakes being the most well-known example, but did you know that there are snakes that hunt in packs, planning and coordinating ambushes, or snakes exhibiting parental behavior, or even displaying gift-giving and grooming behavior, all things that an animal operating solely on instinct would be incapable of. I will talk about all this in more detail in the reptile intelligence video, but in the meantime, I'll have links below if you'd like to do some research search for yourself. Again, hit subscribe if you haven't already and turn on the notification bell so you won't miss when that brainy snake video comes out. So why do these myths about snake intelligence and emotion persist even amongst veteran keepers and breeders? The simplest and what I think is the most common reason is what I said at the top of the video. A lot of folks are simply not aware that new information is out there. Everyone knows snakes aren't smart, so why challenge it? But I also think that there are some who resist this idea for selfish reasons. Once you acknowledge that snakes are more sophisticated than you thought they were, you might have to reassess how you're keeping your snakes or even treating snakes in the wild, disrupting a comfortable routine, or having to spend more money based on new understandings might cause one to consciously or unconsciously dismiss the idea that snakes are more than purely instinctual creatures. Bottom line, snakes are smarter than you think, so let's treat them that way. Yeah. My number three entrenched myth is kind of a two for one. Plastic bins are the best for keeping ball pythons, and plastic bins are terrible and you should never keep your ball pythons that way. Okay, if my experience in the ball python corners of the internet has taught me anything, it is that no matter what I say here, someone is going to lose their noodle. So I'm just gonna accept that and crack on. Please be respectful. <laughs> So let's say you want to get a ball python and you start doing your research about how to keep them. For decades, the common consensus has been that they should be kept in bins. And you're still going to see that with a lot of folks, both pet owners and breeders using bins and rack systems. But for most other snake species, you'll probably see more glass tanks, wood, or PVC enclosures as the ideal home. So. Why is it that so many people feel that ball pythons have to be kept in bins? The logic is that as mostly nocturnal ambush hunters that spend most of their time hiding in burrows, they don't climb and they don't venture far from their preferred ambush spot. A nice cozy bin is the best way for us to replicate this and that keeping a ball python in a larger enclosure actually creates stress and is bad for your snake. The problem is that this isn't true. The fact that ball pythons can live long, stress-free lives in a minimalistic bin is more a testament to their hardiness and adaptability rather than it being the best setup. Wild ball pythons regularly explore their environment and that movement is not limited to the forest floor. Males in particular are semi-arboreal, spending a lot more time in the trees than most people think. There are exceptions, of course, but an enriching enclosure with ample room, good 
places to hide and lots of things to climb can be an ideal home and in my opinion is a much better option than a bin for most ball pythons. So bins are bad then? No, not at all. Well, not if they're done correctly. The biggest stressors that can negatively affect a ball python is incorrect temperature and improper humidity. You get those right and you're in pretty good shape. A plastic tote is probably one of the easiest enclosure types to maintain both of those variables. With that taken care of, and as long as they have enough room to move around and access to food and water, ball pythons, and many other snake species for that matter, can live in bins feeling safe and secure their whole lives. Now, there's not usually a lot of room for enrichment in these types of enclosures, which is the main drawback in my opinion and enrichment can be very important to pet snakes. Studies have shown that snakes with lots of enrichment opportunities are more adaptive. They are better able to manage new situations without getting stressed out and exhibit improved intelligence over snakes without enrichment. Having an enriching home is a great way to provide that extra stimulation, but it's not the only way. Ball pythons kept in simple plastic bins can still get the required enrichment. You just need to give it to them outside of their home. Let them explore outside of their enclosure regularly. Hang out and coil up and explore furniture or your shoulders. Take them outside as long as it's safe. If they're able to exercise their mind and their body, they can get the necessary enrichment and live in a simple home. You just need to put in a bit of extra effort. A low plastic tote, <laughs> I like the word tote. A low plastic tote isn't suitable for all snakes. I would never keep my Macklitz python in one. They are far too arboreal and active, but a ball python can live a long, contented life in a plastic tub. It's not the best setup overall, in my opinion, but if done right, with a little extra playtime with your snake, they can be a perfectly acceptable home to provide a long and happy life for your ball python. Before we move on, I would like to take a moment and say a huge thank you to my amazing patrons on Patreon. Your support directly helps take care of my animals and I cannot thank you enough. Patrons get all sorts of behind the scenes extras like extended blooper reels, enclosure build updates, they know about new animals that may or may not have joined my scaly family, and more. Head on over to patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl to see all of the perks, so yeah, thank you! Next up, we have snakes can only swallow food whole. It is pretty common knowledge that all snakes eat by swallowing their prey whole. And that is true of all commonly kept pet snakes, but not all snakes. The crab-eating water snake, also known as the white-bellied mangrove snake, are aquatic snakes living in tidal mud flats and mangrove swamps of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and Australia. And love eating, big surprise, crabs. Instead of swallowing them whole though, these snakes pin down their crabby prey and bite off their legs and eat them. After munching on a few of them, they move on, usually leaving the crab behind, alive and not well, but alive at least, and hopefully able to grow back their lost limbs. Another example is the Brahmini blind snake, who frequently eats termites. But it is thought that they can't digest the heads of the termites as well as they can the rest of the termites body. So what they do is they maneuver the insect so that they can bite the head off, spit that out, and swallow the body and the leggy bits. Brawny blind snakes are actually really fascinating beyond just their decapitating ways. I did a video on them a long, long time ago and maybe I'll do an update on them. Okay, last up at number five is hognose snakes versus toads. Are you ready? Have you trained well? The story goes like this. Hognose snakes use their adorable little upturned snoot, there, to help them dig through soil and find one of their favorite snacks, toads. Now, toads have several lines of defense to prevent being eaten. They are poisonous for one, but that doesn't deter the hognose snake. Not only does the toad's poison not affect them, hognoses actually sequester that toxin and store it in their body, making themselves poisonous. Tough luck for the toad, right? Well, Mr. Toad's next line of defense is to swallow in a bunch of air inflating themselves like a balloon, making them look bigger to a predator and or making them harder to swallow. No problem. Hognose snakes use their fangs at the back of their mouth to pop these pesky toads and make them easy to swallow. At least that's often the common knowledge among snake folks, not, not snake 
people. They're not they're not snake people. They're not reptile people. They're not they're not lizard people. <laughs> they're they're normal people who are in the reptile. You get it. You'll see this all over the internet on just about anything talking about hoggies. Nature sites, museum sites, state DNR sites. Uh, you may have even heard this from about all reptile YouTubers. I've seen it in Hognose Care Guides, read reptile magazines having this. I've even heard a Hognose snake breeder at an expo tell a prospective customer that Hognose snakes do this. Lots of knowledgeable and credible people know all about Hognose's popping toads, but they're all wrong. Sorry, everyone. It's not hard to understand why though. Hognose snakes eat toads, toads puff up. Pointy things pop puffy things. Hognose snakes have pointy things in the perfect place to pop puffy toads. <sighs> it's a very tongue twisty sentence. And that's why naturalist Percy A. Morris asserted that hognose snakes pop their toads way back in 1944 and it became part of hognose snake canon. It wasn't until 1976 that someone thought to actually check and see if that is true. James C. Kroll did a fascinating study on how hognose snakes hunt and feed. It covered their types of prey and hunting behavior for each, the unique way that they rotate their jaw to manipulate their prey, how they envenomate the structure of their teeth, how their venom is delivered, and the potency and yield of their venom, you name it. In this study, he concluded that the rear fangs serve two important functions, deliver venom and physically manipulate their prey. He also demonstrated that hognoses were incapable of deflating a toad using their rear fangs during normal feeding. Cole concluded that to pop a meal-sized toad, a fang length of 1.38 centimeters was required. Hognose snake's fangs are between 0.3 and 0.5 centimeters. Basically, hognose fangs would need to be about three to four times as long as they actually are to pop a toad. So, while science has known for almost 50 years that this fun fact about hognose snakes is untrue, that hasn't disrupted the common knowledge that was already ubiquitous, at least amongst hognose snake folks. And because there really is no harm in believing this myth, I mean, the truth and not knowing the truth is really not relevant in any way. It doesn't affect how we care for them in captivity or how we protect them out in the wild. And the outcome is the same for the toad. There really is no impetus for anyone to really question this tidbit. It just kind of gets passed down. Heck, if it wasn't for a SciShow video I saw on sublime snakes, I never would have known any different myself. But uh, yeah, hog noses don't pop toads. So, there you have it, my top five myths entrenched in the reptile community. I kind of wonder how many things we know about reptiles today that will be completely out of date a few decades from now. What do you think? Did you know any of these myths were just that? Myths? Were there any you believed as fact? I would love to hear what you have to say and if there's anything different that you would have included. Please be respectful to each other when discussing this in the comments as some of these points can be a hot topic at times. Thank you again to my patrons on Patreon and thanks to all of you guys for watching and until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye. He's like tickling the back of my head, the back of my scalp. Why is it called a scalp, but you call scalp potatoes scalp potatoes? They're not made of brains. No, it's scalloped. Is it? Yes. Oh. Because of how you cut it. Well, it Did you <laughs> honestly think they were scalped potatoes? <laughs> I thought they were gone, yeah. Oh, it's a good thing you're pretty. <laughs> really? It's <laughs> mice, bunnies, guinea pigs, hamsters. They all want cuddles. Is it such a stretch that to think that... Well then pick which one you want. You not to yell. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> Use your words. <laughs> I got a word for you right now. Huh, I'm so used to.